Today, as businesses demand faster time to insights, data engineers, data scientists, and developers are expecting platform to provide not only quicker way to write their code so that the learning curve is minimized, but also to optimize it in the best possible way during the execution so that it can run faster. This will let them focus on solving business problem while platform will do all the heavy lifting behind the scene. Welcome to Ask Trailblazers. I'm Arsad Ali and in this video, I'm going to talk in detail about Spark Catalyst optimizers and adaptive query execution and enhancement made in Spark 3.0. Before we get into the details of Spark Catalyst optimizer, Let's take a step back and look at the motivation and evolution of how we have reached to this place. Back in 2008 and 2009, when Doug Curting brought in the idea of a distributed computing platform running on commodity hardware with technology like Hadoop, it was loved and liked by many people. In this initial version of Hadoop, there were two core components, SDFS, which stands for Hadoop Distributed File System, which is a distributed storage layer. And on top of that, seated MapReduce. MapReduce was the computational engine uh, to do all sorts of processing on top of it. MapReduce, part of this initial version of Hadoop had some challenges. For example, when a job gets executed, it goes through different stages. And with this initial version, the data from one stage to Another stage, if it has to pass the data, the data first needs to be written and reread into the next stage. That made overall experience of running a job on MapReduce slower. When Spark come into existence or when uh, Spark was brought in, the idea was to kind of do whole in-memory processing of your data. And when it moves from one stage to other stage, it doesn't require to kind of store the data temporarily on the uh, disk storage layer. If you look at this architecture of Spark, Spark was offered as a computational engine only. And it was supposed to have open uh, interfaces to connect to different type of a storage layer. So this was only focusing on the computational layer. There, there was a core component of a Spark called Spark Core Engine. You can think of this Spark Core engine as OS or operating system for distributed computing platform. This Spark Core engine handles important functions such as fault tolerance, memory management, job scheduling, storage system interaction, etc. Spark Core makes use of a special data structure known as RDD and this is something that we'll talk in more detail in, in, in upcoming slides. On top of this, Spark Core engine sits different types of library, library for different kind of use cases. For example, there is one library for batch processing. There is one library for machine learning. There is one library for a stream uh, processing. There is another one for graph computation. While this was very performant when we were trying to execute the code on Spark, um, the challenge with, with this initial version of Spark was that as a developer, I not only need to know what I want to execute, but also had to specify how my codes are going to be executed. So as a developer, it was my responsibility to tell engine that how the codes would get executed. Obviously, this was not scalable and it requires a steep learning curve for anyone to get onboarded onto a Spark platform. That was the motivation for bringing a query optimizer uh, which has been uh, in, in relational world for a very long time. Started with version 1.3, data frame API along with the query optimizer was introduced in uh, Spark uh, and, and the data set API were introduced in 1.6. And this catalyst optimizer has evolved from one version to other version. In version 2, um, there were several enhancements with respect to cost-based optimization and we'll talk about that. So as you can see, 
On top of a Spark Core engine is the Catalyst Optimizer, which is um, a query optimization engine, which optimizes your code on submission for execution as well as during execution of your code. And on top of this Catalyst Optimizer sits all the library. So this Catalyst Optimizer is coming in between um, Spark Core engine and different library that we use to submit the job on top of it. On the bottom, if we see, uh, we have this resource and uh, cluster manager. So in order to manage different resources of the cluster, Spark uses different or it, it supports different type of resource manager. The one that we use in uh, Spark pool in um, Azure Synapse Analytics is called uh, Yarn at another resource manager. That's one of the most advanced and uh, uh, provide so many uh, different other capabilities which are needed for uh, today's uh, uh, resource management. So that is the resource manager that that's that's uh, currently uh, available in uh, uh, Spark pool. However, Spark as its open um, uh, framework supports different type of uh, cluster um, and, and, and resource manager that you can uh, use uh, in your deployment. Before we get into the details of Catalyst Optimizer and how it works. Let's first understand what, how the physical execution of a job looks like when you submit a job in, in a Spark. So in a Spark pool, when you establish your first session, a cluster uh, uh, gets created and that has an application attached to it. Then as you start submitting your job or when you start calling action operation on, um, on, on the data transformation that you are doing, a job gets triggered. This job has multiple stages based on how many shuffle it requires for your job to complete. And then each of these stages has multiple tasks based on how many partition of the data that stage is going to work on. And based on the number of cores that you have in the cluster or kind of assigned cluster, the number of tasks or the number of partition processing will be kind of equivalent to the, that. So for example, there is one one mapping between the number of available core and the number of tasks that uh, we can execute. Say for example, if you have two uh, worker nodes with uh, eight cores on each of the worker nodes. So we have total 16 cores in the cluster. So 16 tasks at, at one point will, time will get executed. The, in, in other words, we can also say that 16 partition data will be processed at one point of time. So the number of tasks will be dependent on the number of partition getting created and the number of stages will be dependent on how many times it has to do the, the data shuffle operation and the job gets triggered when we submit an action operation um, during the data transformation. The Catalyst Optimizer optimizes the structural queries expressed in SQL or via data frame or data set API, which can reduce the time, run time of programs and save overall cost. Developers often treat Catalyst Optimizer as a black box that just magically works. L let's, let's look at how Spark Catalyst Optimizer works with an example. Let's say we have a data set with multiple columns and we want to kind of group the data on column A by doing an aggregation, taking average on column B. And then we want to do a filter on column A where the value is greater than 10. So this is a very simple um, query that we want to execute. And this is what you see on the left side. So this is a data frame um, query that we have written. Now, if we have to write the same query using the RDD uh, API, um, this is the example is there on the right side. So if you can see, we are using map to first do uh, a mapping of the data. Then we are doing the reduce by to do the aggregation. Then we are uh, map again and, and um, dividing uh, the total value by the total count. And finally, we are doing a filter. So on the right side, if you see, there are multiple kind of set of API being called and the order of this API call matters when the code gets executed. This RDD based code gets executed. So as a developer, I have to make sure that the order or the code that I'm writing is optimized. Whereas in case of uh, the data frame API, Catalyst Optimizer finds the 
efficient execution plan for a given data set or SQL query. Let's look at this with an example. Let's say uh, we have this catalyst optimizer and this is the query that it has to go through because we have written this query in uh, data uh, using data frame API. So the first thing that happens is like it based on um, the query that we have submitted, it, it does the analysis of the query and it validates all the tables and the columns being referenced are valid and creates a logical plan. This is what you look, uh, it looks like. So starting with, if we can see here, um, it, it's first scanning the data to bring in the data into a um, um, computational engine or Spark computational engine from the file system. And then it's doing the aggregate based on the aggregate that we have specified. And then finally, it's applying the filter. So this is the initial plan that gets created. However, in the process, it, it optimizes the plan. So when it optimizes the plan, this is what it does. It knows that because we are filtering all the row with column A greater than 10, and that can be pushed down right after um, scanning of the, uh, of the data. So it, it pushes that filter from top to right after the scanning of the CSV file. So in this case, scanning of the CSV file happens or the, the data gets pushed is scanned from the file system. Then the filter is applied to filter out all the rows which are not necessary to serve the request uh, for this query. And then only selects the column which are necessary to serve the request of, of, of this query. So in this case, we are only touching column A, B, and uh, there might be additional columns. Those column will be pruned by using the project operator over here. And now because we are doing a uh, group by on uh, column A, that requires a shuffling of data across different nodes so that um, the relevant data exists at one location, the exchange operator is being used over here. And finally, has aggregate is being used to do the final aggregation on the data that has been collected over here. Let's take, take this same example and go through each stage of uh, uh, Catalyst Optimizer and see how it moves from one uh, stage to other stage. So to start with, if you look at this, we have this unresolved logical plan getting generated when we are submitting um, uh, the job. Um, that is what the analyzer gets. And analyzer consult with the session catalog DB to resolve all the references that we have in the query, with, for example, with respect to table, columns, data type, and all those things. And based on that, it creates the resolved logical plan. So from un unresolved logical plan to resolved logical plan, the transition happens from uh, or with, with, with uh, analyzer. So in this case, scan T, aggregate and filter, the order of the operator remains same, but uh, it has resolved the references of tables and columns and all those things. And then it goes into logical optimization. So the, during the logical optimization, this is what it happens. It scans the data and it filter out, filters out all the data which is not necessary to serve the request. And then it only includes the column which is necessary to serve the request and rest other column it prunes. And it does the aggregation or use the aggregation to aggregate the final data. So this is the optimized logical plan. Next come the physical uh, optimization and uh, physical plan generation. So this is what you see. Uh, on the right side is, is the physical plan that's getting generated, which will be executed uh, after, after this optimization. And as you can see here, after the scanning of the data, we have filter operator, which is now a physical operator. Uh, project is uh, another physical operator exchanges to exchange the data um, across a different worker node and has aggregate is the has aggregate operator the physical operator to execute the code um, uh, in, into the spark compute engine this is another way to look at um, the catalyst optimizer so there are four distinct stages. It starts with analysis. It goes through the logical optimization. It does the physical, opt, um, uh, uh, physical planning and physical optimization and generates the 
physical plant based on um, the cost model that it uses and then finally the selected physical plant whatever that comes out uh, from this uh, uh, catalyst optimizer the equivalent rdd codes generated and that rdd codes that optimized rdd code gets executed which gives you the most efficient and most performant uh, performance for your uh, execution of uh, your query with that let's look at the differences between rdd data frame and data set api right so RDD is the concept which came um, uh, uh, from initial version of the Spark and it continues to be. This is the lower level API. And RDD is a distributed collection of data objects spread across all the nodes without any schema defined on it. Whereas data frame is also a distributed collection of data, but it's organized into name columns. Dataset is a new set of API which was introduced in version 1.6 and is only available in a Scala. Given the dynamic nature of Python, we do not have dataset in Python. Um, in, in, in Python, we have data frame API to use with. With respect to optimization, there is no built-in optimization engine for RDD. As a developer, we need to write the optimized code by, by ourselves. Whereas in case if we are using data frame API or data set API and uh, the, the execution of that code before it executes goes through the catalyst optimizer for optimization, we do not have to worry about how the code should get executed. We just have to write our query what we want to do and it takes care of how part. With respect to projection of the data, when we are using RDD API, we need to define a schema manually. With data frame API, it will automatically find out the schema of the data set. With data set, it will also automatically find out the schema of the data set by using the SQL engine. And data set has an additional advantages which provides compile time safety because we use a class to define the structure of our data. So that's a core difference. With the data set, we define first a case class, say for example, in a Scala, which has the structure of our data. And that is what we use to define the schema for the data that we are going to use. With respect to aggregation uh, operation, RDD is slower than both data frame and data set to perform simple operation like grouping of the data. And this is because there is no optimization built in with, with RDD. Data Frame API provides an easy API to perform aggregation operation. It performs aggregation faster than both RDD and data sets. Data set is faster than RDD but a bit slower than our data frame in most of the cases because of, because of the additional overhead of maintaining the class for, for defining the data structure. In a study, done to do an aggregation of 10 million INT pairs. We have this stats coming from this study. So let's look at that. So if you look at the RDD used in Scala language, the performance was almost two times better than the performance of RDD used in Python. Given the Scala is the native on on um, uh, on, on this path. So this is, in this case, as you can see, uh, the performance or, or the execution time was little over four um, seconds uh, with, with RDD in the Scala, whereas the time taken to execute the same code in Python with RDD API was close to or more than nine, nine minutes, right? So this is the difference with RDD because there is no optimization built into it. However, when we use data frame API and irrespective of whether we are using SQL or R or Python or Scala, all this code goes through the same catalyst optimizer and at the end, optimized code gets generated. It doesn't matter which language we are choosing. At the end, we, we are expected to get the similar level of performance. And this is what you can see on those green uh, bars. So in all of these four cases, as you can see, and the team who did um, this test 
found out that irrespective of what language that we are using, it's going to, going to be taking the same amount of time. In terms of rule execution and rule executor, rules are defined as sequence batches of rules. Batches in sequence are applied one after another. Rules within a batch are applied continuously till the fixed point or until it's fully optimized. Let's look at this with an example. Let's say we have two data set and we want to do a join on these two data set and then we want to do an aggregation and we want to filter out some of the data based on uh, one of the column from table one. So this is the query that we have submitted. Let's see how it goes through uh, the rule execution engine to optimize uh, this execution plan. So the very first thing that it notices that the filter that we have on T1 and column A can be pushed down after aggregate. So this is what it does. It, it pushes this down after aggregate. In the next iteration, it pushes that filter down after join because we are only selecting a subset of the data from table one. So this is how the rules are get, getting applied one rule at a time. Like I said earlier, the catalyst optimizer was introduced in version 1.3 and in after every release, there was some new enhancement getting added to it. With Spark 2.0, cost-based optimizer was added. However, Spark 2.0 or um, a later version of uh, uh, Spark 2, it has single pass optimization by creating an execution plan. Once execution starts, it is sick with that plan and start executing the rules it created in the plan and does not do any further optimization. So basically, when we submit the query, a plan gets generated and the execution of the query from a start to end happens based on the plan that was generated in the very beginning of the uh, query execution. Spark 3.0 added a new capabilities called adaptive query execution, which brings dynamism into the execution of your code. During the execution, it re-optimizes and adjusts query plan based on runtime metrics collected during the execution of the query. This re-optimization of the execution plans happens after each stage of the query as a stage gives the right place to do re-optimization. After enabling adaptive query execution, Spark perform logical optimization, physical planning and cost based model to pick the best physical plan. By doing the replan with each stage, in a study done, it was found that Spark 3.2 performs two times better over Spark 2.4 when it was uh, done on TPCDS queries. So this is the plan that um, it goes through. So what you see here in this uh, um, different stages of the query optimization is unlike the previous case, it has a feedback loop and based on the runtime metrics that gets collected after execution of each stage, it goes back and it goes through the logical planning and optimization one more time. It might not be as good as coming up with the best plan in the first place, but it has a chance of improving the performance as, as the new uh, stats about the data gets collected during the execution uh, time. So in summary, Adaptive query execution, compute a statistics at runtime and update the plan if needed. At the end of each stage, it gets the actual estimates and try to optimize the remaining plan based on the newest stats. There are few useful optimization that was brought with adaptive query execution. As of now, there are three types of this optimization. The very first one is changing join type. We know that in Spark, sort merge join is the default um, physical join operator. However, broadcast join provides the fastest possible joining, joining of those two tables. So with this optimization, what it does is it looks for an opportunity where it sees or uh, if the, the, the query optimizer can switch from sort mode join to broadcast join based on the new stats that has been collected. So basically it converts sort mode join to broadcast join. The other type of optimization is handling partition skew. Data skew can severely downgrade the performance of join queries. 
This feature dynamically handles SKU insert merge join by splitting and replicating if needed SKU task into roughly evenly sized task. Let's look at this with an example. As you can see here uh, in the top image, there are four partition and given that A0 is skewed in this case, the overall duration of the execution of this stage will be dependent on the task uh, going to process A0. So this way, the overall processing of this stage will be kind of uh, much higher than what it's supposed to be. And in this case, adaptive query opt optimization with, with the feature that it has for handling partition SQ, it splits this large partition to smaller sub-partitions, which is of roughly a similar size of the other partition. So as you can see on the image on the bottom, this A0 partition has been split into 0 and 1 as a sub-partition of A0. And there will be multiple tasks processing this, this uh, uh, number of partitions or sub-partitions. That way the overall duration of execution of the stage will be minimized. This is what it does by handling a skewed partition. The third optimization is coalescing shuffle partition. This feature simplifies the tuning of shuffle partition number when running the queries. We do not need to set a proper shuffle partition to fit our data set. Spark can pick proper shuffle partition number at runtime. Let's look at this with an example. So the very first image that we can look at, as you can see, there are multiple um, partitions over here some of the bigger some are a bigger partition some are a smaller partition and there is no coalescing over here this is a version prior to spark 3.0 without adaptive query uh, 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 query execution uh, if you have this feature enabled uh, if the smaller partition will be kind of uh, most together to make it bigger partition so the number of partition is reduced and the overall time to execute those queries are kind of same for uh, or, or similar for all the partitions so this this actually helps in in, in scenario let me help you um, understand this with an example let's say um, we know that several partition is by default 200 in in, in a spark so that's where it starts so the idea here is if we are kind of keeping it too low, we will have a smaller number of partition with large volume of data that might reduce um, the parallel execution capabilities as well as have potential to spill out data on disk. This is in case if we have the smaller number of partition, a smaller number of large partition. Likewise, if we have large number of a small partition, it has overhead of maintaining the metadata of those many large number of partitions. And to overcome this scenario, this uh, feature will help, right? So you start with a large number of partition and as it progresses, it realizes that the number of partition that we have, some of the partition can be coalesced to kind of make it uh, compact, more compact and overhead of maintaining large number of partition can be minimized. It, it coalesces those, those uh, partitions. Now let's look at some of the examples and look at ways to look at and analyze execution plan. Here I am in uh, Synapse Studio. I have this Catalyst Optimizer notebook open over here. Uh, you'll find the link to download this notebook from the description in this video. So what I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to take a couple of scenarios and explain you how you can look at this plan and try to understand the information which is available as part of this planning process. So in this case, um, I have two tables and the examples that we discussed earlier about joining two table, doing an aggregation and doing a filter taking the same examples and walking you through to see how to look at the execution plan and how to make um, sense of it. So here in this case, as you can see, I have deemed product as a um, dimension table. So I'm kind of reading this data from my delta table and creating a temporary deemed product uh, uh, table over here. Likewise, I have a fact table uh, with, with almost two billions of rows and I'm creating that um, uh, table based on uh, the fact table that I have here. Now in the next cell, I'm kind of joining these two tables. So I have this da um, data frame. Uh, this is for a product dimension or 
the data coming from the product dimension so this is the data set getting joined with uh, the uh, online fact data set uh, and and um, the based on this joining key so from product side i have product key and from um, online sales side i have product key right so based on these two joining key i'm um, joining these two uh, data set and then i'm applying a filter where i'm filtering all the data only for um, uh, 2009 so i'm basically selecting data for 2009 only in this case this is what you can see so this is this is a very simple transformation that we have applied by joining two tables and applying a filter now if we go ahead and execute this code this code gets executed but what we want to do at this time is to look at the execution plan that's 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 being used to execute this code so this is what we need to do so for a data frame with all the transformation that has been applied we execute or call this api called explain uh, which takes one parameter the value is false in this case and if the parameter is false uh, it's going to give you the only physical plan if you set it to true uh, like the one uh, in the last line it's going to give you all the um, uh, plans the logical plans as well as the physical plan for now i'm interested only in physical plan for this query for the simple query of joining two table and applying the filter let's look at and try to see how this um, uh, this works so for that if you see because we are reading data from two different data set it, uh, sets uh, we see there are two file scan here and one another one is here so let's start with the first one so we have this file scan operator which tells that we um, this this engine is trying to read the data from uh, the table that we have specified or the location that we have specified in this case it's coming from this location and because there is no partition on this table um, there is no partition getting applied when we are trying to read the data however as you can see there is a filter being pushed down to when we are scanning the data and this happens because when we are doing an inner join on two table we are sure that there must be a value on both side if there is a null on one side that row is not going to be included given it's an inner join so from that perspective it's trying to reduce the row which is not necessary to serve the request for this query so that's when it's trying to push down this filter as low as possible in the plan so that less and less data comes up in the hierarchy so this is how it does by pushing um, the filter down here now because it's a columnar uh, storage uh, it, it has to convert into raw format so this is another um, uh, operator which converts columnar format to raw format and again it applies the filter to filter out the product key uh, which is not null in this case and then finally it broadcasts this table uh, to all the worker node given the size of this table which is within the limit that we have for auto broadcast uh, has joined uh, this table this is very small table uh, so this table is being broadcasted to all the worker node in the cluster so this is what you see now i'll come back to this one let's go back to the second data read so in this case when we are reading the data for uh, fact internet online sales data again it's reading all the columns from this data set and it's reading from this specific location where we have this data set however in this case as you can see uh, unlike uh, the previous case where we were not having any um, part partition in this case we have partition and we are filtering the data it's actually pushing this partition filter down uh, at the scanning level itself so it means like this table might have multiple partition but we are going to only pull the data for partition 2009 or the engine is going to pull the data only for partition 2009 rest of that it will ignore and post filter is same as the previous one this is what you see um, and and this is how uh, the data comes the data, data is being read only for 2009 again it's being converted to row and the filter is getting applied to uh, filter out any uh, product key which is no and 
after that there is uh, a join and in this case as you can see the join is broadcast has join and it's based on product key on the both side and it's going to be an inner join and build left is basically tells us the left side of the table is is the broadcast is table so this is how you read the execution plan that gets generated one thing that you will notice over here is while it was able to push all the uh, kind of uh, uh, partition predicate that we have specified or or uh, some of the predicate that we have not specified and it it makes sense to apply those those kind of filter like in this case it's a inner join so product key should not be null so it's trying to remove all those rows rows so those are the things that it's it's already taking care but because we have not kind of uh, selected a specific column from this table it's actually selected selecting all the columns from both sides right so this is one thing that you will notice over here now let's go to the next cell and in this cell what i'm doing is basically i'm doing a group by on brand name and i'm trying to calculate the aggregation of sales amount using the summation method over here so this is the frame uh, data frame that we had earlier the one that we created over here as you can see and we are applying this group by and then aggregation and now if you look at the execution plan there are subtle differences that you'll notice over here let's go to the first file read for uh, product dimension as in this case we are only kind of selecting or we are interested in some particular column it's only selecting those columns it's ignoring the data or data read for the rest of the column so in this case it's only reading data for product key and then it's reading data for brand brand name right and rest of the things remain same likewise if you look at um, uh, the data for um, fact internet online sales or fact data it's selecting product key it's sel selecting the sales amount on which we have to do um, uh, aggregation on and sales here is the um, uh, filter that we have for partition right so these are the only three columns it's being selected so basically it's trying to prune all the columns which are not necessary for uh, this query execution so in, in addition to that what you'll notice is from the last time where we had the last operator to do the broadcast has joined on this two data set now after this broadcast has joined uh, it's selecting only the column which is necessary for further uh, doing the aggregation. So, uh, so far we had brand name, sales amount, and then we had uh, uh, sales year also, but sales year is not necessary for aggregation. So it's excluding those columns. So it, it's only selecting the column which are necessary for uh, calculating the aggregation. And then it's using has aggregation on the brand name uh, by doing a sum on sales amount. Right. So this is how you can read your execution plan uh, for the query that you are submitting with data frame or data set API, which goes through catalyst optimization. Now, this is this is one way to look at this execution plan if you are uh, developing this in Python or in a Scala. But if you are a Spark SQL uh, developer, you can write explain before the query that you are going to execute right so if you run this it's going to generate and give you the same execution plan that we saw earlier right so you can copy paste into notepad editor and you can have a look at um, this execution plan it's going to be same as this previous one now as i talking about earlier right so broadcast has joined gives you the best performance of joining two table given that one table is being broadcast ends, and with that it doesn't require to suffer the data across however um, there is a limit or there is a threshold that has been set uh, to specify how big of a table can be broadcasted so in case of this spark pool configuration that you see the default value is around 26 mb you, you can change this configuration if there is any need. Uh, if if uh, you have a bigger table that you want to broadcast, you can change this configuration, but make sure you have enough resources available in the cluster for broadcast to work properly. So this is how you um, um, change the broadcast uh, setting. Now comes this query. So let's say I'm executing this query and I'm getting this result right so the one way is to look at this execution plan is to when we are connected to cluster we can look at this execution plan 
However, um, the Spark UI or a Spark history server UI also provide a way to look at this uh, execution plan. Especially a Spark history server UI will be helpful in case your cluster is kind of uh, shut down, right? So to do that, you click on this open a Spark UI. On the Spark UI or a Spark history server UI, uh, on the job page, you'll see all the jobs that has been submitted on this cluster, right? And what you'll notice is job group ID 9 is the one that we executed most recently where we have the data um, coming in in the, uh, in, the, in the Synapse Studio notebook experience over here. This is what we an want to analyze and see how it looks like into um, a Spark UI or a Spark History Server UI, right? So given this, this is the 9 job group ID you can click on this SQL tab over here at the top of this uh, page this will take you to another page and you click on the job group for a statement 9 so this is 9 is something that we are interested in if we click on this what we saw earlier as text for uh, physical execution plan you'll see that in a graphical um, mode over here so in this case again as you can see um, there are different uh, like it's, it's trying to scan the data from two different data set though there is one scan uh, parquet of uh, number of files read over here is 42 and uh, there are certain other metrics that you can uh, look at over here likewise there is another read, read of data for a dimension of a table over here right so that's something that you can look at over here now, after this scanning, it goes through columnar to row, um, a row conversion, then the filter is getting applied. And because this is a dimension table, broadcast exchange is being used to broadcast that data to all the node. And then finally, um, this, this side, if you see, broadcast has join is being used to uh, join this data. Uh, then finally, the selected columns in this case sales amount and brand name is being used and finally the aggregation is being thus done using has aggregate physical operator uh, by using the um, uh, some some function on sales amount right and this is what happens and uh, this is the graphical way of looking at the execution plan you can click on this detail and you will see the same plan over here in the text format as well so this comes handy when you're um, cluster has been shut down and you are not able to see that the, those execution plan and if you want to come back and look at your execution plan when you are doing a troubleshooting this is spark history server will still have those details and you can look at it analyze it like like I talked about uh, earlier right so adaptive query execution is a new feature which was introduced in spark 3.0 and, and it was not by default on in 3.0 and 3.1. It, it's going to be by default on for 3.2, but if you are working in 3.0 or 3.1, uh, Spark pool has 3.1 at this time. So if you look at the configuration, you'll see this feature is uh, set to false. So it means this feature is di uh, disabled for now. If you want to enable this feature, you have to set it to true and everything will work or, or the adaptive query execution will kick in, in in that case. So this this is a broader umbrella setting that we have for adaptive query execution. And like I said earlier, there are three types of optimization that it does. The very first one is changing the join strategy from uh, merge, uh, sort merge join to broadcast join or shuffle has join. That's the number one optimization. Number two optimization is handling the partition skewness. And number three is uh, coalescing the smaller partition to make it bigger and, and efficient for execution. So these are three different types of optimization that, that uh, gets applied when the code gets executed. This The setting that we are seeing over here is the broader setting and it covers the broader umbrella to enable the setting at um, uh, for, 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 for these three types of optimization. Once you enable this, all three will be kind of active at that time. You can go ahead and enable, disable each of those um, uh, subsetting also to control uh, what, what type of optimization part of um, adaptive query execution that you want to enable so for example if you want to enable um, only uh, shuffle uh, shuffle 
कोलेशिंग ऑफ सफल पार्टीशन और और पार्टीशन स्क्यूनेस एंड यू डू नॉट वॉन्ट टू इनेबल चेंजिंग द ज्वाइन स्ट्रेटेजी सो यू कैन गो बैक एंड सेट द सेट द कंफिग्रेशन फॉर चेंजिंग द ज्वाइन स्ट्रेटेजी टू फॉल्स एंड देन इन दैट केस एडेप्टिव कोर एग्जीक्यूशन विल बी इनेबल्ड बट it's only enabled for the two of the optimization which is which we just just talked about the one that we have disabled will be not activated so basically the point here i'm trying to make is you have a broader level setting to enable adaptive query execution as well as you have a granular level setting to enable or disable each of the optimization that adaptive query execution includes with that it's time to say goodbye again for now Thank you once for watching. Please do like, subscribe and let me know your feedback or any specific topic you'd like me to cover next. Looking forward to see you all in the next video.